Boa noite a todos. Bem-vindos ao Pavilhão do Conhecimento para mais uma temporada, não é? Temos que começar a falar, embora a ciência viva nunca pare, mas isto é um pouco o regresso da temporada. Eu vou agora falar em inglês, visto que a sessão é em inglês, e para os nossos convidados também poderem uh, uh, participar. So, welcome to the Pavilion of Knowledge, which is the headquarters of the Ciência Viva Association. The Ciência Viva Association is uh, uh, an association of scientific institutions uh, with a mission to promote science education and science culture in Portugal. So, we support science education projects, we support uh, science projects, science education projects and outreach projects. Uh, and uh, the, we have been very active all along the summer uh, on one uh, hand by uh, supporting uh, placements of uh, secondary school students all over the country, which are run by the scientific institutions. And the uh, other activity we do is uh, Ciencia Viva in Summer. Well, yeah, Ciencia Viva in Summer is uh, our largest outreach program and astronomy is at, in our hearts since the beginning in 1996. So we started with astronomy uh, in summer and uh, this uh, reaches out now to thousands of people all over the country with support of scientists, astronomer, um, amateur astronomers, uh, museums, science centers. So astronomy is really deep in our hearts. Uh, we also have a network of science centers uh, all over the country and I see here some uh, representatives which are very welcome and help us to in our job of promoting science and technology. So I, uh, I hope you had some opportunity to, to, to see around, especially those who come from outside our country. And I would like to uh, finally uh, thank the European Planetary Science Congress and the Astronomy Education Alliance uh, uh, for, um, for asking, for putting us this challenge of bringing Matt Taylor here. Matt Taylor, thank you very much for having come. I would also like to thank Nucleo and the Project Global Hands-On Universe, and of course the International Astronomical Unit who are hosting this large conference at Cascais. So you are all very welcome, and you thank you for this opportunity. Now I would ask Pedro Russo to uh, present Matt Taylor, please. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna, and thank you to all the team in the Knowledge Pavilion for welcoming us here tonight in this uh, wonderful night. It's great to see the room full of people. My name is Pedro Russo. I'm an astronomer based at Leiden University in the Netherlands, but uh, maybe you recognize my accent from Portugal. I'm, I'm Portuguese, and I'm one of the organizers of the planetary, of the Congress that we are having in Cascais. And it's really a pleasure for me to be here tonight as an astronomer, as a science communicator, because this is one of the most exciting things that we have been doing in the last years in Europe. And, but this is a story that in a way is very rooted to Portugal. I, this story started 7,000 years ago, most probably, when some of people living at the time in the territory that we now call Portugal observed for the first time a comet that they represented in the nice cave that we call Paulo Pinta in the municipality of Alijó in the northern part of Portugal. A team of uh, archaeologists and astronomers from University of Coimbra found out that the repres... Oh, I don't have my slides, that's why... There's no slides. Okay, here we go. So, this is the, the story that I was telling you. So, some of uh, our ancestors looked at the sky and saw some strange objects that at the time was a comet. And this happened uh, 3,000 years before Christ, so more than many years ago. And, uh, like I was saying, a team of archaeologists and astronomers from Coimbra University found out that this is the representation of a comet. Uh, and now it's Funny because so many centuries, millennia after, we are going now going to a comet as Europeans, as a whole, exploring this amazing comet. So it's a great pleasure that we have here tonight Matt Taylor, 
a British scientist, now based in the Netherlands, we are almost neighbors, and uh, he's based at European Space Agency in the Netherlands, and he, he studied physics at the University of Liverpool, and then he did his PhD in plasma physics at the Imperial College in London, and now he's here with us during this week in Qashqai's first presenting some of the results of Rosetta, and now here in this evening, telling us a bit more about this big adventure that is Rosetta. So Matt, w welcome to Portugal, and I think he, on behalf of the Knowledge Pavilions also, I think it's a pleasure for them to have you here, and we are looking forward to listening to your talk. Thank you. short announcement the, the the seminar is being transmitted outside as chairs and you see the exactly the same thing you just don't see him live you don't see me <laughs> so go outside but you can <laughs> hear him anyway and if you prefer to listen outside and then come back for the questions it's as you wish otherwise you'll have to stand and wait uh, for the hour okay that was all okay thank you everyone i will try and not get too excited and not speak very quickly, um, but I'll look at your faces to see if I'm successful. Uh, I'm Matt Taylor. I'm the European Space Agency Project Scientist for Rosetta. That means I represent the scientists of the world for the agency, and we make sure, or I make sure that we can do the science with the spacecraft as best as we can. And I have a colleague in the crowd from ESA as well. You'll see if you can spot him in a photograph that I show later on. Let's get on with Rosetta, an overview of why we look at comets as well. So I'll talk about the solar system and comets briefly, uh, look at previous comet observations, Pedro has already alluded to some, and then go on to Rosetta, to its target comet, and give an update of what, what we're doing now and where we are. Okay, so solar system and comets, why do we look at these? Incidentally, the background is an image from the International Space Station uh, and this is Comet Lovejoy, so it's just a, a nice picture showing and also some lightning in the, in the uh, atmosphere. But, and again, the fact that these are fantastic objects to observe. So what are comets? Many, many years ago, a, a big gas and dust ball collapsed and formed the sun. This will eventually be shown in this animation. It's a bit slow. Once the, the gravitational pull of this matter was su sufficient, it formed the sun. So this is this collapsing disk that then forms a, a protoplanetary disk. And from this matter, this material that is stretched in a disk, the planets were formed. The leftover material from this planetary formation, this debris, are the small bodies of the solar system, the minor bodies. So once you had the planets and the moons formed, the leftovers were these smaller bodies, these asteroids. So this is the asteroid belt. This is an artistic rendition, not a real picture, um, which formed between three and five times the distance from the Earth to the, to the, the Sun, so between Jupiter and Mars. Lots of thousands or millions of these rocky bodies. An additional set or um, class of objects are the comets, and these were thrown right outside the solar system to form the Kuiper belt, so here is on the outside of the solar system, in the disk of the solar system, and even further still, we have the Oort cloud. This is vastly further out than uh, the edge of the solar system. It measures something like a whole light year. That's how far away it is. So these are the source regions of the comets. And so what are comets? They're something that evokes imagination. They were actually something that people were saying were foreseeing doom arriving. They were a bad messenger. But we study them because of this connection to the early solar system. This is very busy this plot, I apologize, and it's moving a bit. Um, the point being we have different classifications of comets. We have short period comets and longer period comets, dependent on what part of this reservoir, the Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud, they come from. I will be talking about Kuiper Belt 
sourced comets, these shorter period comets. Um, if you may have heard of Comet Ison, this sun grazing comet that uh, came last year and disappeared as it went around the sun, that is an Oort cloud based comet. It's uh, very effervescent and uh, very volatile and disappeared, unfortunately. But I'll be talking about Kuiper Belt ob uh, objects or derived comets. What do we see with a comet? You have a general representation, which is a gas-like tail or plasma. This is an ionized, electrified gas formed by the interaction of the comet with the solar wind, the outer atmosphere of the sun. They also have a dust tail. This is really what you see from the Earth when you see a comet. This large tail is mainly the dust tail. So the material that's being thrown off of the comet's surface, the nucleus, forms these two tails. And one thing that was very surprising from previous observations or the space-based observations was although these entities are hundreds of thousands of kilometers in size, sometimes tens of thousands across, the actual body in the middle, the nucleus of the comet, is very small. For this one here, Halley, the, the famous Halley comet, is only about 15 kilometers across. So they're actually quite small compared to what you see in the sky. And there's an activity cycle with comets. So if we look here, this is the comet when it's at its furthest distance. This one's actually a re rendition of the Rosetta target comet. It becomes more active as it gets close to the sun. When it was out in the Oort cloud in the Kuiper belt, it was frozen, deep frozen. When it comes towards the sun, it starts to melt and sublimate. This is the ice in the comet changing immediately to gas and throwing off with it the dust that's also mixed in with the ice and forming this gas and dust tail. And subsequently, as it moves away from the sun, this activity reduces because the interaction is reducing with the sun. So let's look at some comet observations. See, as Pedro had introduced earlier, they've been around for a long time. There was this foreboding doom associated with them many years ago. So we have documented evidence and also cave drawings as well, showing these from hundreds, thousands maybe, uh, of uh, years BC. But we have these documents from the Chinese, also from ancient Greece. Uh, this tablet here is of Babylonian descent, and by looking at the text, they believe it's actually talking about Halley's Comet. There's a theme here that will pop up a few times, but this, this, this comet you could backtrace and say that this is actually being, that they're speaking in this text, I can't read that, but uh, that's talking about Halley's Comet. Some of us from Northern Europe know what this is. This is the, uh, the Bayeux Tapestry, depicting the wonderful Normans coming over to England and invading. Now, this, uh, this is Latin, I don't know it very well, but this is people marveling at the star. This is a comet, this is Halley's Comet. And again, this was, was it a message of doom? Was it a message of joy? Depending on which side of the English Channel you were, you can make that decision. Here is Harold, it was probably bad for him. Jumping forward in time a little bit, we can make ground-based observations with the telescopes that we have, the very big telescopes. And moving on from simply measuring the comet, you can look at the spectroscopy of the comet. You can look at the different components of the light within the comet and determine what the comet is made from. So this is what's shown here. This is the different wavelengths of light and emission lines. You get an emission line, which is a reactance of light with particular chemicals within the atmosphere of the comet. On the right-hand side, there's a Hale-Bopp image showing the different activity, the jets, which are, come out at different sides of the comet. Then we have space-based observation. This is one of these Oort cloud comets, uh, a, a sun grazer, because it goes so close to the sun, it doesn't survive. So we see this again. SOHO has picked out probably the most comets. This is a, a solar observation satellite, an ESA, a NASA mission, uh, that has picked out a number of these sun grazers. The explosion was not associated with the comet. That was some uh, separate activity, a coronal mass ejection. It was just coincident that it occurred with the comet passing by. This is a newer uh, space-based observatory, the, the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory. I'm not sure if you can see this properly, but across the face of the sun, you'll see this faint trace. Now, there's a comet going across the face of the solar disk. 
if you can pick out the tail is waving, it's interacting with the atmosphere of the sun coming off and the magnetic fields, and that's perturbing the tail. It looks like a tadpole or a small fish, and you see this interaction, this plasma interaction, which I find very sexy, but that's because it's my background. But I, uh, my science, that's what I do scientifically. I'm interested in things that are invisible, magnetic fields and, and ionized plasmas. That's what you see in interaction here. And that's pretty cool. <laughs> Believe me. Here is a wonderful mission, the Herschel Observatory, ESA's Herschel Observatory, the biggest uh, space, the space telescope, or single uh, mirrored telescope. It was pointing at comets to look at a particular characteristic. They were measuring a particular flavor of hydrogen. So looking at a ratio of hydrogen to deuterium, another type of hydrogen. So this is what this plot basically shows you. It's, it's, it's water and then de deuterated water. It's a red tray. So you look at these, right, why do you look at this? Why do we look at this? This is targeting a particular question involving solar system dynamics and evolution. When, if you go back to remember the video I showed at the beginning of this collapsing dust cloud and the, the planets forming, that early stage of the solar system was believed to be too hot at the, at the Earth to retain water. So somehow we want to work out how, given this system or this, this uh, theory of how the solar system evolved, how the water got back to the Earth, how you're there. Why are we here? Because we're made of water. So we look at comets as possibly being a delivery mechanism of water to the, to the Earth. And to, to make that match, we can compare this type of water, these ratios of flavors of water, with the water that we see in the Earth's oceans. So that's what Herschel was doing. Uh, this is a, ignore too much, a lot about this plot. The point being that this is the line, this ratio between these flavors of at Earth. And for a particular class of comet, a Jupiter class, one of these shorter period comets, it was found for Hartley 2 that this ratio was similar. So maybe indicating that that comet, that class of comet, obviously that one didn't deliver water to the Earth because it's still there, but that type of comet could have been a viable delivery mechanism. We can also look at other observations, in particular looking at water in Jupiter's stratosphere, the outer atmosphere. So here's some more Herschel observations. This is picking out a particular line in spectroscopy of water. And you can see that it's mainly in the southern hemisphere. We go back to some previous observations where Schumacher-Levy in the 90s was a fragmented comet and actually impacted Jupiter. And so we see these impacts in the southern, but all of the impacts are in the southern hemisphere. So it appears that a viable mechanism to have delivered this water to Jupiter were cometary impacts. And there's actually some scarring in the upper atmosphere here, and this was taken by the Hubble satellite. So that's where Schumacher-Levy impacted Jupiter. I'd mentioned it before, but we go back to Halley now, or Hawley, depending on where you come from in England. It's 1P. That is a classification of comets, meaning it's a periodic comet. It's coming back all the time. We, we work out how its orbit evolves and how the periodicity of that orbit is. So that was the first one that was classified way back in the 1705 by Edmund Halley. It last appeared in 1986 and will next appear in 2061. In fact, I haven't got the slide, but there's an association with Halley and Mark Twain, the American author. He considered himself a freak and said that Halley is also a freak. I came in, he was born the year that Halley appeared, and he predicted he would die when Halley reappeared, and he did. So he said, I'm a freak like this comet, I'll come in with a comet, and I will go out with a comet. And it was an accurate prediction. This is, or was, Giotto, ESA's first deep space mission. It was targeted to go to Halley's comet way back in 1986. This was named after an Italian Renaissance painter, not this guy from Star Trek. <laughs> this time period was fascinating for cometary science. This was the first time we did this. There was a whole flotilla, this is in German, um, the slide, but the point being, there's Halley, 
And here's Giotto. It passed the closest to the comet, within about 100 kilometers. There were a flotilla of other spacecraft from the Russians, uh, the Japanese, and the Americans. I see you may know this is the one that's been revived now um, by uh, public outreach. Um, all of these, this flotilla of spacecraft investigated Halley in the 80s. But Giotto got the closest and gave us some of these impressive results that gave us a leap forward in our understanding of comets. They indicated, this was the first real indication that there was a nucleus, a solid nucleus in the mass of the coma. That it had ice and dust as, uh, as its main constituents. And that it was active due to the interaction with the sun. So the jets were pred predominantly, this stuff coming off, was predominantly driven by the sun. And as I'd shown before, the nucleus is rather small, just over 10 kilometers. Um, this is one of the university groups that I work with, not at this time. Uh, you'll see why in a minute. But uh, they, they had a plasma instrument, again, plasma, cool. Um, so it's University College London, uh, Mullard Space Science Laboratory. This is the Johnston analyzer that was on Giotto in 86. For reference, that's what I looked like in 1986. <laughs> before the tattoos. The reason <laughs> my mum wouldn't let me, that's why. Uh, um, I show this because at that time there were some videos, uh, or some at the time films, made for British television, and you can get them on YouTube. Horizon videos of the Giotto Halley encounter, and also it then subsequently went to another comic, uh, Greg Skelleroth. In the end of that movie, you see this flashed up on screen. This is the original idea for Rosetta. So this is in 1989, roughly. They were thinking then of a comet nucleus sample return. They quickly came to the conclusion that that was a bit too extravagant, maybe. And then it evolved to the Rosetta that I will now describe. But that's the kind of time period we're talking about. This is late 80s. They were already thinking about Rosetta. So we had Halley, and we had Giotto, and that flotilla, that group of uh, spacecraft. Here, I, there were many more spacecraft, but I only list the ones that were imaging comets here. So we've had a number of cometary missions, uh, spacecraft to comets, and their targets here. There's a particular difference between these and the sexy Rosetta mission in that these all did flybys at hundreds of kilometers distance and at very high velocities, so tens of kilometers a second. So they provided a snapshot of the comet, and then phew, they were off. You had this snapshot in time. Rosetta, going to churimov gerasimenko which rolls off the tongue very easily after a year of playing it a lot, um, was within, or is going to get, and you'll see in, in a minute, gets way within 100 kilometers, 10 kilometers, 8 kilometers distance, and is at walking pace. We are now this fast with respect to the comet. So we are traversing the solar system at the same speed relatively as the comet. But I've got ahead of myself. Let's go back and just talk more about Rosetta in general. Oh, and I'll talk about this, this very difficult name. Um, OK, let me jump there. So Rosetta, where does the name come from? It comes from the Rosetta Stone. This was a, a tablet that was found by the French and then stolen by the English story involved there, but it was key in deciphering the Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, also, we have the Philae Temple of Isis here, which is the name of the lander um, that sits on, to, on Rosetta, you'll see in a minute. But we make this comparison to those entities, the stone and the, uh, and the, and the obelisk, in un, un, uh, deciphering the, the hieroglyphs and how we will try and decipher the history of the solar system through the investigation of the comet. This is Rosetta, a graphic of it. Um, it's quite big. It's 32 meters tip to tip. That's the same size as a basketball court. Or if you're English and you measure things in a, in a, in a measurement unit called a chain, it's about one and a half chains. What's a chain? A chain is the length of a cricket pitch. So anyway, I digress. Let's get back to this. Um, the spacecraft is about three meters high by two meters round. It weighed at launch around three tons. 
the fillet lander, which is stuck like one of these baby pouches on the, on the front of the spacecraft here, is about as big as a washing machine, depending on how big your washing machine is. Uh, but it has these kind of dimensions, just under a meter square, depending on if it's got its legs out, and weighs about 100 kilos. This really encapsulates what is important about the Rosetta mission, what makes it unique, what makes it sexy. It's the first mission to rendezvous with a comet, the walking pace. We're going to escort it as it goes around the sun next year, for over a year. And also, if you may have heard, we're going to land on it as well in November. And it will provide us with this unprecedented characterization. Never, we'll never get this advanced without doing this. We're going to get this fantastic idea and understanding of this comet. To do this, we have a full suite of instrumentation, scientific instrumentation both on the orbiter and the lander. We have remote sensing instruments, cameras uh, looking at different frequencies of light, as well as in situ measurements. So we have things that will look at a distance and the stuff that's kind of going, uh, it's sniffing and tasting the dust and the gas that comes from the, from the nucleus and the coma. I'll skip through these. These are just listing what the uh, different instruments are. Philae has another nice set of instrumentation. It goes one better than sniffing and tasting. It's going to scratch. It's going to scratch and dig into the surface and cook things and fire things at them and, and try and see what the, the real surface is and, and the material, the composition. The target comet. Churimov Gerasimenko. That is Klim Churimov, and that is the DG of ESA, and that is Svetlana Gerasimenko. This is Klim more recently. So this was at the launch uh, in 2004 of Rosetta, um, and that was me lucky enough to meet Klim in a, in a conference recently in Finland. Uh, he, he's quite short. He's not standing in a hole. He's, uh. <laughs> anyway, they found this comet in, um, in 1969. Uh, it's a Jupiter-class comet. It goes out just beyond the Jupiter orbit. It takes about six and a half years to do one full orbit around the sun. Rosetta launched over 10 years ago, 2004. A problem with going into deep space is gravity at Earth and how much you can launch. You are mass limited. To get really far away, you need lots of fuel we could not get enough fuel up to get us directly to the comet. So we had to use the Earth and Mars, the gravity to slingshot us out towards the correct orbit to get us out to where the comet orbit is, which is shown here. We got so far out in 2011, I'm jumping ahead of this because I want to go to the next slide. Oh, oh there you go, there was the, uh, the comet just going through perihelion. Right, let's, I'll, I'll do it now. We actually flew past a couple of asteroids on the way as well, some you know, extra science. But we went so far away that there was not enough power to power the spacecraft, so we had to put it into hibernation for over a couple of years. Let's quickly go through what happened up to then, up to 2011. We had a nice flyby of the Earth. This is a NAVCAM image. Quick bit of plasma physics. Uh, at the same time, uh, that Rosetta flew past the Earth, we have a number of other fantastic missions. I have a graphic representation of this mission on my leg. Um, this is the cluster mission. It's a four spacecraft mission that investigates how the solar wind, the outer atmosphere of the sun, impacts the magnetic field of the Earth. So we had, right, this is, a, this is called a bow shock, but I won't go into it too much. What do you want to know is, right over here, let's look at this plot here. I'm the sun. Oh. And the solar wind gets wrapped around, and, and the magnetic field wraps around like a tadpole and drapes around. The cluster was up here in the reasonably pristine solar wind measuring things. Rosetta flew past the Earth and was going down the tail away from the sun. We saw something here that was like a current sheet, different magnetic field configuration, a slab of magnetic fields that hit the Earth's magnetic field and made it wobble. And we saw that at Rosetta and also on the ground. So we were able to make this association with all these measurements just because Rosetta happened to be there. It was a really nice piece of science, believe me. 
Okay, then we had uh, one going past Mars. That's Mars, it's red. More plasma. Okay, we also have the wonderful Mars Express mission. As Rosetta was flying past Mars, Mars Express was there as well. And we were able to join the measurements, looking at the magnetic field oscillations, very nice. And we were able to see how the interaction of the solar wind with, the Mar with Mars was varying, comparing it to our understanding through simulations, and it was shown to be a little bit wrong. So that flyby, this data, or these data that we got from uh, Rosetta in collaboration with Mars Express, gave us a better understanding of how that interaction works. We also did a selfie. So, <laughs> if you remember, here, let's look at this. Um, we've got Rosetta and Philae. Philae was actually sat there, isn't it? And that was looking out down the arm and did the selfie. But no duck face. That's And we had another gravity assist around Earth. This time, this is actually um, from the ground. So that is actually Rosetta whizzing past the Earth. So uh, Nick Howes and, and colleagues captured this as it whizzed past. Then part of the, the, the mission, the, the profile of the mission, was to capture some images and sample some asteroids. The, one of the first target was asteroid Steins. So we were able to characterize the size of this asteroid around uh, six by four kilometers. We were about 800 kilometers at closest approach, traveling nearly 10 kilometers a second. There was a little bit of an issue with the camera. That's why it's a bit blurred. Some people think that that's a spaceship. And the ESA are hiding data that really shows that it's a spaceship. But I assure you, it's a big lump of rock <laughs> that is shaped that way because of physics, not because of stupidity. <laughs> Another, the, our final gravity assist through the Earth. This was a very nice image uh, used at the Osiris, a nice crescent. We're also able to do some other stuff. This is the Virtus, the infrared spectrometer, or visible and infrared spectrometer. We were comparing data from Rosetta with one of the Earth observation satellites. So we can calibrate how we think the instrument will react given the calibrations we understand from an Earth-based satellite. And what they're pointing at here is uh, North Africa. And this is looking at the radiance of the Earth, the radiance. So it gives you an idea of uh, what the surface features are. And here's the corresponding image taken by the Osiris camera. Then we got to Lutitia. Right, this is going like this. The spacecraft wasn't limping. This is just this, the shutter speed is changing, that the frequency of images is changing, and we just stick them together. So that's why it's doing this jagged approach. Much bigger body, un over 100 kilometers in size. And here we travel within about 3 kilometers at 15 kilometers a second. We got to see some fascinating things like this. You can count the, the craters here to give you an idea of the aging of the, uh, of the body. And here are a, a, a ejector from this crater, perhaps, that have then fallen back and start to roll back down into the crater. Then, as I said, we went into deep space hibernation in 2011 because we got too far away. Just before we went into hibernation, we pointed the space flight. So we're going through the different um, cameras that we have on board pointed it at the target comet there and got this image from on board to say, we'll be there in a couple of years. So where are we now? We have, in the meantime, and, and persistently been observing the comet from the ground. And I'll show you a most recent image from that, which is important for us to understand, to check all the time we were in hibernation, that the comet was behaving as we expected it to. So that's a, an, this is run by professional astronomers but you can also join some groups uh, led by the wonderful uh, Padma, who is at EPSC now, runs this group on Facebook. It's a closed group because we try and keep things uh, constrained in terms of our discussions. But this is for amateurs to join in. It's amazing how many amateurs have fantastic equipment. And one of the problems we have with Rosetta in the next few uh, sorry, Churumokirisomenko in the next few months is its position in the night sky. It's easier for smaller telescopes to see it, so it's interesting for us to engage with 
people that have smaller telescopes, the, uh, the amateur uh, community, to get some more images and understand the comet a bit more. This is one of these ESO, the European Southern Observatory images of the comet from uh, late last year. We also have activities that simulate what we believe the comet activity will be based on previous observations. This is a group that works closely with the science working team, the, the lead scientists of the mission, in simulating what we believe will happen in terms of the plasma and the gas and the dust that comes off of the comet. We ran a significant PR campaign for this wake up. So we hedged our bets that it was going to be successful and people were submitting videos of how they would wake up Rosetta. Now, when I joined Rosetta, I only joined Rosetta last year. I used to work on the cluster mission. Do you remember that one? It's great. But I had to tell my mother every couple of months what I did as a job because she didn't understand plasma physics. I don't know why she didn't understand plasma physics. I said, Mom, I'm going to join the Rosetta mission. It's going to go to a comet. She went, I understand comets. Rosetta must be really good. Then she said, I know a song about Rosetta. And I thought, oh, OK, Mum. And she pointed me at this song. And it actually is poignant for the wake-up event, the hibernation exit, because we were all thinking exactly this. Rosetta, are, are you better? better? Are, are you well, well, well? well. There you go. Anyway, um, and it was. I won't go. The, the rest of the lyrics don't really count. It's about a woman that drinks a lot of whiskey and falls asleep a lot. So, <laughs> as I say, yeah. And it was. If you saw this in January, this is what we were waiting for. This signal, this carrier signal. The the spacecraft was just pointing, just going. Oh, I'm here. I'm here. And then we picked it up, and everyone was happy. Look, there we are. Yay. I like to see, this is uh, uh, Catherine Altbeck. She is one of the PIs of the, one of the instruments, a very good, great instrument, the Rosina instrument. It's one of the ones that sniffies, sniffs the gas that's coming off of the, uh, of the comet. So she's very happy, of course. And yeah, there it is. Look, see, down there, that's it there, waking up. So we exited, and everyone was happy. So what are we being up to? We are then looking at, are we there yet? This is another campaign that we were running. Um, a particular thing we had to do when we exited hibernation, we were still traveling pretty fast. We were traveling around 800 meters a second with respect to the comet, trying to catch it up. We had to arrest that speed. We had to slow down through a subsequent set of maneuvers to get rid of that speed to allow us to get in at about one meter a second to walking pace. So that's what we've been doing over this time scale. And of course, like your kids in the back, those, well, those of you with kids, they're sitting in the back seat going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And that's what we've been doing for the last couple of months. And we ran this competition for people to basically say, what are you doing? What's your travel? Can you make an association with this massive journey that Rosetta has undergone? So we started to get some data of the comet. So this is from the Osiris camera, the wide angle part. This was first light, and then zooming in, that was our first glimpse of the comet, that we were doing the right thing, getting the right direction. This was a VLT image, so again, one of these ground-based images. Who can spot the comet? There it is. <laughs> I never can see it without putting the circle on it. Some more images. This was taken over this time scale, where you can see, look, it's developing activity. So the comet is growing in size. A coma develops. But then, to our surprise, it stopped doing that. So we were seeing, ah, this is unexpected. But comets are supposed to be unexpected. So it's doing what we thought. Believe me. Are we there yet? That's what we were saying. Still, still journeying. We were doing measurements, though, some fantastic measurements. This, is the, this was a measurement made by the Miro uh, instrument. It's a submillimeter. It looks at submillimeter frequencies of or the wavelength of light. It was measuring water coming off of the surface, equivalent to you going to your garden in, outside your house, looking at the moon, and measuring two small cups of water coming off of the moon, evaporating every second. So that was this measurement at that distance. I think that's quite good. This is the science working team. This is the core. This is the group of people. This is the instrument. 
teams, but also the very hard-working people at ESAC in Madrid, the guys doing the science operations. They're working their butts off at the moment. It's really, they're working very hard because they're doing three different science plans plus a plan for the future and another plan for the future all at the same time because comets are unexpected. So we have to plan for very different things at the same time to make sure we cover all of our bases. And where is he? Where is he? Can you see yourself, Miguel? There he is. My colleague from ESAC, one of the very important people that take the instrument commands and put them on the spacecraft. He helps us do the science that we're supposed to do. Very important task. But everyone's still smiling here. We've got a lot of work going on, but we're still smiling. Another instrument taking measurements here, this is Virtus. It was looking, it's an infrared spectrometer. It looks at the surface of the comet and measures the temperature. And from that, you get an idea of the surface composition of the comet. What we found from here, it's about minus 70 degrees, which indicated that it wasn't very icy. It was actually quite dusty and porous. So we're already, and this was quite near, over 5,000 kilometers away, so still way away, we're still getting ideas as we're slowly approaching. Now this is, or these are pictures and images and, and, and models of what we believe the comet to look like about, well, 2012, but before we got there. So this is based on images from Hubble. So you take, you look at the comet with Hubble, this dot, and you keep on looking at it, and you see that it flickers, and you get this variation in the light intensity. And from that light curve, you can measure a rotation rate, and then you can calculate what the shape of the comet looks like. And that's what we thought it looked like. We, looked, we thought it looked like a flying potato, a gray one. We didn't do very well, because <laughs> it looked like this. It looks like a big gray duck. This is my attempt at my, doing a comparison. <laughs> I pity the fool. We see activity. So this is a, 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 an image from the wide-angle camera from the Osiris um, imager. We see these large jets coming off. We see this coma, this atmosphere is already there of dust and gas. This is one of the instruments that does that tasting. It, it, it's looking for the dust. It's finding the dust coming off and, and characterizing the velocity of the dust, the distribution of sizes of the dust. And that gives us an idea, and we can project backwards to the nucleus surface. And that's just, we're just on the cusp of being able to do it, on the edge of being able to really get some data now, because we're getting closer, we're getting close. And now we're there. So we got there, and we had a couple of people that were very excited. We didn't look very excited there, but this was different from the hibernation, because we had no data before we got that signal. Here... This is important to see. These very nice, clean signals, which are probably the cleanest that the engineers and operators had ever seen from Rosetta, I think they're the, the thruster temperatures. So they saw this fantastic curve. So everyone was reasonably relaxed because it looked like it was going fine. This was the last rendezvous maneuver. We had had 10 to slow us from 800 meters a second to 1 meter a second. So this was the last one in 10. And that was when we rendezvoused. We were on the same orbit around the sun as the comet. And these are winners from the Are We There Yet competition. They were asked to provide a story and, and, and a journey that they were on. We have a, a mountaineer who'd taken his certificate up to the top of a mountain. And then people were, well, this, this one I like because it's, uh, it's Rosetta in a bottle. It's in the ocean. It's this connection with water and the journey. And this is a set of frames of the NAVCAM imager from the 1st of August up to the rendezvous itself. And what you'll see is there's a slight over performance of the thruster for one of the final maneuvers, and that's why it's moving down. <laughs> so it was actually, it's expected that that would happen, but it's quite worrying when you first see the comets going, you're going, oh, over here, and you're supposed to be over there. But then it righted itself, and then we were in the right direction again. This is the one that looks like a Klingon bird of prey. It's very deceiving to see it in two dimensions. Something that we use for landing site selection are what we call anaglyphs. Now, I didn't want to show one of these, these 3D images, because I didn't have enough glasses. But 
you really get a perception of the depth of everything. So this looks like a big hole. It's not. It's quite shallow. Some of these entities look flat, but they're not. They're, they're very steep. And when you wear these glasses, and I suffer from vertigo, I don't like heights, and it makes me feel sick looking at some of these, you know, because you see this depth. And it's really a fascinating object. It has characteristics of every other comet we've ever seen. So it was a very good choice. <laughs> so yeah, this is one of these, you can't see it, but these are the kind of the cliffs at the head of the duck, and then the, the lower body. And you see these stratified layers and these cliffs. Then we have these regions of open plains, and you think this is like sand and grit, but these, these things are about 20 meters high and wide. They're massive big boulders. So what have we been doing since rendezvous? We have been beginning to map and touch on the gravitational pull of the comet. So we do these large arcs, or we have done these arcs, gradually approaching the comet, sensing the gravity of the comet. We believe, based on previous observations, and we're getting a better feel for this, that the gravity of the comet is a, something like the equivalent to a millionth of the gravity you are feeling now. So it's quite a low gravity environment. We're only getting a slight sense of the gravity at 100 kilometers, then down to 50. Once we went within 50, we started to feel, and then we can sense what the mass is of the comet. So now, this is now, really. We are now transferring into the global mapping phase. We are now in orbit. Once we go below 30 kilometers, you're trapped by this gravity. Outside, you, don't, you can't have a classic orbit. It'll just fly out. Now, within 30, we are there. We are actually orbiting the comet. This, as you can see, the global mapping, that maneuver to put us into that orbit, to get us to 29 kilometers, is tomorrow. And then subsequently, we will go lower and lower. And again, this is one of the things that's going on at the moment. There are breakpoints in this plan. Can we go lower based on how the spacecraft is interacting with the comet. The comet has this coma, this gas coming off. Is it pushing the spacecraft away? Can we go lower? And that's why it's so busy at the moment, because we have three plans in case it can go lower at each stage. And this is a recent release. Oh, it's not going quite. Anyway, this is a release from VLT. So this was this, this month, uh, sorry, no, last month. Uh, from the ground-based observatories. This is measuring the, the coma of, uh, of the comet, the atmosphere. This is around 19,000 kilometers. You consider then that in one pixel, one point there, is the comet, and inside that point is the comet and Rosetta. That's how big this entity is, and we're inside that. You may say, well, you saw those images that looked very bland. There was no atmosphere when we were at Rosetta. This is just the difference in how the cameras are tuned in terms of how they, they integrate the signal. So they're really focusing on the nucleus. There was another shot I showed of the wide-angle camera that really saw the coma. It's just how you run the instrument, determining on what you're looking at. So that's why you don't see dust all the time. You don't want to. This is one of the major things that we're doing now. We're trying to look at where we will deploy the lander in November. We had a meeting a couple of weeks ago in Toulouse where the landing science operations are carried out. And we selected five landing sites, three on the lower lobe and two on the upper lobe. I'm leaving Portugal tomorrow, unfortunately. I came on Sunday. I leave tomorrow because I have to go to Toulouse this weekend. And we will make history by selecting a landing site on the comet, the, 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 the one which will be announced on Monday. So we have a, quite a busy weekend ahead of us. Again, some more recent images. Here we show a, a raster. Because we're so close, the NavCam imager, which we use for navigation, it takes around 20 minutes for the signal to go to the spacecraft and back again. So we can't drive it with a joystick. We have to plan everything ahead. It's automatic. It has to see the comet. So it does this with its camera. It does rasters to try and find the, cam to try and try and find the comet all the time. If it doesn't see the comet when it's doing that, it runs away from the comet because it doesn't know where it is, and then it goes into a safe mode. So these are, these are done in this way to make sure it's got a wide angle of where the comet is. And this is a more recent image. So we're leading into November now. 
we should get within well, five to 10 kilometers. This is the decision we'll make this weekend to really see what trajectory fits what landing site. We then have, well, if Mars Curiosity rover had seven minutes of terror, we have between five and 10 hours of agonizing pain because that's how long it'll take for this because it will drop at say five kilometers and we just go <laughs> and then the lander's like and it is traveling this fast from five kilometers or above towards the comet under gravity well, I've jumped ahead of myself let me just do this so yeah and then it lands this is a low gravity environment so as it lands it screws itself into the floor. There's a little gas jet on the top that pushes it down so it doesn't just bounce off again. And just to make extra sure, it fires two harpoons in the ground as well, two spikes, which are actually measuring the surface as well. The, the depth that they travel into the surface will tell you something about that material. They also measure conductivity of the surface electrically. The feet of the lander have little things that vibrate. And so they will measure sound waves through the surface. And of course, we have the, the Shiva imager that's showing here to see if we can see Bruce Willis. Um, <laughs> and we have other, which is already played here, but we have the Mupis instrument, which is like a little hammer, again, probing the surface, trying to see what the surface composition is like through the, the, the mechanical reactions. And then what do we have? We have over a year more of science. So the lander deploys in November, and right the way through 2015, the orbiter will continue its science. It will pass through, the, the comet passes through perihelion, closest approach to the sun, at 1.2 uh, astronomical units, just between Mars and Earth still. That's when it's most active. So we'll still be there, ringside seat, watching this occur. The lander ultimately has a limited lifespan. It will last in best cases, up to ma March next year. And by that time, the temperature situation on the comet and the, the lander will be beyond the specification of it running. One also has to consider that the environment of the comet isn't particularly good if you want to have solar cells getting sun. So you're in a massively dusty environment. So it relies on solar energy to recharge its batteries. And that's the, one of the other problems. As well as, if you remember what the comet looks like, the comet is a problem for us to land on it. It's a difficult, difficult thing we're doing. So now I will come to a conclusion. As I've said many times, it is for me the sexiest mission. Uh, we have the sexiest people working for the mission as well. <laughs> it's the first mission that will shadow a comet. We are in walking pace with a comet. We will follow it around the sun. We will work out and understand how a comet works. We will see changes from now. So if we go back and think about the Klingon bird of prey image of the comet, and you can pick features out, the close-up pictures of the boulders and these indentations that look like craters. We look at them again in November next year. And what if they've changed? We expect them to change. If we think about Halley's Comet, this was a much more active comet. It was apparently losing up to a, a good few meters, tens of meters of surface height. So it actually erodes. So we'll be able to measure that. We will measure the volume and its change as it goes through perihelion. And of course, we have the scratching and sniffing of the fillet lander. It will provide us, as I say, with this most detailed study of a comet. And as I say at the bottom, it's so awesome, somebody has got a tattoo of, and is so confident it will land, they, they put it there. So stay tuned. On Monday, we have the landing site. In November, we deploy the lander. We go through perihelion, the closest approach to the sun, in August next year. Anomaly, the mission will end in December 2015. Stay tuned. The ESA blog is the place to get the most information. That's where I get my information from. So there you go. It's approved. But that's where you get it. We're trying to feed as much information. The, the Twitter feed, for those of you that can tweet, uh, is also a very good source of information. So. Stay tuned, and thank you for your attention. I hope you understood everything I was saying.
Thank you so much, Matt. It was a fascinating talk by a fascinating mission. And now we have some time for question, remarks, and comments. So the floor is open for anyone that wants to start asking questions to Matt. There's one. But the microphone is coming. We are recording the talk, the, the talk so. Oh, it's working now. Just to no. shout. Or was it planned no, from it, the beginning? It was planned for. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it was part of the plan because it's inefficient to run a spacecraft at such low power. Um, you have to keep everyone working. So the best thing to do is just to put things to sleep. And we had to put it in a special configuration, spinning it very slowly. But it's more efficient when you can't do anything to leave it asleep for that time. Uh, can I do another question? Or sure. After the end of the mission in December, so the, the lander Philae will run out of power and it'll... Most likely in around March next year, it's already yeah, yeah, dead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, Rosette itself? Uh, Ultimately, the lifespan is driven by money. Um, we are currently funded until the end of next year. But the biggest constraint we have is fuel and then power as well, because this has gone through perihelion. It starts to move away from the sun by late 16, it starts to get in the same situation, it's losing power again. But it's really fuel. We, we are trying to budget properly for fuel usage in the main mission. We might not actually have enough fuel to carry on. But this is all gonna, we'll get a better idea once we have deployed the lander, then we'll really understand how the, how the spacecraft is working and how much fuel we have. More, more questions? I'm sure that you are, Hui. The microphone is coming. Oh, you got yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Uh, what is the set of criteria to choose uh, the landing site? There are. Um, well, you can see the comet. It's there's a lot there. When we thought it was a potato, yeah, but then the the potato's got lots missing in the middle. So for if you look at the landing sites, there was never anything near the neck because you just can't get a trajectory to hit the neck. So that's already gone. You have the criteria of safe landing. We have to be able to achieve a trajectory, a deployment, that will allow it to go on, on the surface. We have to choose a, a surface area that the error, of, I didn't really go into this, but the interaction of the spacecraft with the gas coming out of, uh, of, of the comet means that you are uncertain most of the time where the, com where the comet and the spacecraft actually are relative to one another. So that imposes an error in your landing deployment. So it's actually a kilometer circle. R that's where we're targeting. We don't know somewhere in that. So you have to look at this comet through a circle of a kilometer and find some safe landing spot. And that's very challenging. There are regions you can see, if you look at the bottom of the duck, that looks nice and flat. But the problem with that region is it's only sunlit for about four hours per rotation, which means the, or the lander won't have enough power to go beyond 60 hours from once it first lands. You also have to consider whether it can transmit signals to the orbiter. So it's sun, it's being able to contact the orbiter, it's landing on a reasonably flat surface, not one of these 20 meter boulders. And the other fascinating thing is a low gravity environment, but if you think, here's the orbiter, or sorry, here's the lander coming to this surface, and it can land perfectly, it's nice and flat. But if the center of gravity is somewhere lower down here, it will actually pull the lander. So it's this very strange environment. You have to consider that if you're on a nice flat surface here, and the center of gravity is here, that's fine. But if the center of gravity is here, the, the lander will just slide where you've just landed. So all of these are the considerations that we come, and also science. So we have to think, well, certain lobe areas, these layers, we think may be indicative of lots of processing of material. So they may be thick with material that's had lots of active uh, uh, activity and processing. So basically, they're not primordial. That's what I'm trying to say. Whereas other regions, 
the, the, the surface will be shallow in terms of when you drill down, you'll get to the really cool stuff. Whereas some of the regions may be thicker in terms of dust that won't allow you to get to the primordial material. So all of this is what we discuss this weekend. Um, let me congratulate you and the whole team because this is a wonderful mission. I did my master's on Halley's Comet and I was in a Heidelberg meeting where they presented the results and so, uh, soon after they started talking about these missions. And uh, I really agree with you, this is the sexiest mission ever. <laughs> this is really amazing to be able to fly, to fly over it and landing on that, this is really amazing. So let me put now one or two questions. Uh, what is the escape velocity at 30 kilometers? I mean, we are keeping Rosetta flying around and... Uh, oh, you've got me there. Um, I know that, that, I think that's the Hills radius. So 30 kilometers is the limit of a bound orbit. And I believe we're, I think, the, I'm, well, I, can't, I can't do it off oh, yeah, the top okay, of my okay. head. But, yeah. but I, I was wondering, how often do you have to fire the thrusters to keep the orbit? Because is it really, they are turned what off and just... We have to do a, uh, an orbit correction every, th I think we check the navigation every three days. And there's a constant, okay. yes, yeah, so, uh, that's, that's where this error comes yeah, in. Yeah. Um, actually, we showed a plot in, 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 the, in, the, um, in the conference on Monday where we, you have where you think you'll be and then where you actually are. And then you have to correct that. Yeah. And you can imagine this is a complication for where we were seeing the fields of view of these remote sensing instruments. So if you're trying to aim somewhere and actually you're here and you thought you were here, so these are all of the things that that guy in the back that does the commanding, the girl, that he oh, has yeah. to do this kind of thing. Yeah, my last, my last uh, final question is, do you have enough fuel to go through the helium and the outgassing of the, of the comet and the impacting on these solar panels? Yes. Now, one thing that, yeah, we, we're planning to, we, we've got enough delta V to take us to, to the end of next year for sure, but there's a big margin. So we need to get, get rid of the lander, and then we have a better idea of, wh of what we're doing. Um, one thing I didn't point out is, if you remember the way the spacecraft orbits, it has its solar panels not facing towards the comet. They're at a terminator orbit, so it tends to orbit in the terminator, which is the, the plane between the sunlit side and the dark side. And that presents the minimal cross-sectional area to this outgassing. So it reduces the impact of that. There's another question from the third row. Uh, I was just wondering if the landing of the Rosetta, and that is going to land, that is going to land, uh, if it's going to change the trajectory of the um, comet. The comet weighs about 100 trillion kilos, I think that's 10 to the 13, and the lander weighs 10 to the 2. So I think it will have a very, very small impact, but it, it will be very, very small. So it, by, just by physics, it will, but it will be almost undetectable. There's one question. Um, uh, how sure is the uh, scientific community of the model of the origin of the solar system that uh, you told us? And um, how the, um, that mission, the Rosetta, will um, um, give us the knowledge to better understand the origin of the solar system? The study of comets does that. If, if we take the consideration that that is a viable story of how the solar system evolved. From the scientific principles, it seems that that's viable when we see other solar systems as well. It will give us that idea of where the comet came from. So just by sampling some of uh, the, 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 the molecules in, in the comet, we can see how far away it formed from the sun. The, the information we get there, constraining how we believe the dynamics of the solar system works, will then allow us to look at other solar systems. Being able to characterize churyumov gerasimenko so fully will then allow us to apply our knowledge there to other comets that we've observed. We are doing these ground-based observations of the comet at the same time, 
most of our observations are taken from the ground of other comets. So we can do all of this comparison to build a picture, a better understanding of where comets sit within that picture of solar system evolution. Can, can I ask a question? Me? Sure, Katya. <laughs> uh, what will this comment tell us about all the comets? Well, it's, it's kind of what I was alluding to. I have to say, one can look at it in different ways. Again, I'll go back to plasma physics and my old job uh, working on the cluster mission. We were looking at this phenomenon called substorms in the magnetosphere. This is something that drives the northern and southern lights, the aurora. You basically have certain conditions in the tail side of the Earth that drive the aurora. And a colleague of mine who uh, is a director of the lab in, uh, in Boulder ha has made a statement about substorm physics. He says, if you've seen one substorm, you've seen one, one substorm, basically. So maybe you could say, we're going to go to this comet and we'll know a hell of a lot about this comet. But that's only one comet. But it, a it does enable us to constrain other observations of other comets. So for me, having the, the corresponding ground-based observations, being able to fully characterize how this comet works, this is another thing, just observing how it interacts with the sun in general will allow us to throw out a number of theories uh, of, of how this thing works. Um, one thing I didn't go into as well, one of the measurements we make is a dual measurement. We have the lander on the comet and the orbiter that fire radio signals at one another. And the radio signal will pass through the comet and give us an idea of how the nucleus is made up. So it's the first time we'll be able to make that measurement and that will be then applied to other comets and we'll see if there are similarities between others. One last question before I, I, I'll ask the final, final question. Okay, there's another one the there. Final, so final, two, final. Two, more, two questions. One f first from, from the front and then we we'll go to the back. Is Please, it Anna. true that it is uh, warmer and darker than the other comets that have been observed? Um, well, th this Virtus measurement was shown that, yes, it's, it's not got as much ice as expected, maybe. But then others are saying it's as dark as we thought it would be. So it just depends from what perception. One thing that's come from the UV spectrometer, uh, the ALICE spectrometer, it's very, very dark. This is something that I should have maybe pointed out. We see these images in gray and it looks very bright. The comet is really, really, really dark. Its albedo, its reflectance of light is lower than 4%. It's blacker than tarmac, like the dust or the ink that comes from a black printer. It's very dark and that's indicative of what we're seeing. We're seeing very low albedo, emissions, aren't as high as we expected. So there are certain things, yeah, that aren't as we expected. There isn't, and there is this question of, well, if we're seeing water, we don't see surface ice. So there's a question of how that works. So it's, again, we're learning more every day. Yeah. Final question from the floor. Okay. Board. As scientist as you are, do you think it's possible a Rosetta project uh, by landing in the, um, a comet will be possible to study asteroids in the future? What we're doing with this mission, where we've rendezvoused, yes, th this kind of technological advancement is applicable to future missions, to, to take two asteroids as well. Certainly, the US are very interested in what we're doing. They're shadowing uh, what we're doing in terms of navigation to then apply to their future missions where they want to get an asteroid and then drag it back to near Earth to then start mining. So this kind of interaction with small bodies is applicable. Yeah, basically every time you fly a spacecraft, you will learn something. And we've learned quite a lot about Rosetta and, and how to do this because it's first. So yeah, we've made the first step and you'll apply that to other activities. So I guess I'll, I'll ask the final question. I think is the question that everyone wants to ask, Matt. Can you show us the Rosetta tattoo? Oh, I did, there. <laughs> yeah, it's there. <laughs> there it is there. I'm not able to see it. It's there. There it is there. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good one. Thanks for your patience and your attention. Thank you. And stay tuned. Really do. This is unbelievable.
I'm actually 22 years of age. This is stress. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for uh, your wonderful conference. We really, really thank you. Thank you. And uh, I would just uh, like to say to the audience that please stay tuned because we will follow up uh, all this wonderful, sexy mission, Rosetta. So in November, stay, stay uh, aware of us because uh, on the 11th, we will uh, follow up everything. I have heard now that it's seven to 10 hours well, but uh, we'll manage to be always transmitting information and trying to explain and to have uh, Portuguese scientists here explaining uh, to the public uh, here and over the internet what's going on. So thank you very much for having come. Stay tuned and thank you once more. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.